I'm Mike Gilliam with updates on the latest research into sickle cell anemia and autism and demystifying gluten and information on fatty foods and your heart. Science in you starts now. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. New research shows the number of children affected by autism is growing. Today we take a closer look at what's behind that and what it means for families. That's ahead on Science and You. I'm Mike Gilliam. Science has delivered a medical breakthrough that some say cures sickle cell anemia. That's ahead on Science and You. I'm Donna Hanover. You have a gift to give, whether you know it or not, that could save someone's life. That's ahead on Science and You. I'm Magalie Laguerre Wilkinson. How do you measure your health? Is it your exercise routine, or how often you see the doctor, or even how often you get sick? It turns out the biggest determinant might be the one we don't think about at all, our gut. That's ahead on Science and You. I'm Tina Beth Pena, nutrition mist. One day it's good for you, the next day it's not. Separating the scientific fact from fiction when it comes to food and our health. That's ahead on Science and You. Hi, I'm Erna Bell DeMillo. Millions of Americans are going gluten-free. So why are so many people giving up wheat? Well, coming up on Science and You, we take a close-up look at the science behind gluten. And our first stop is Pip's Place here in the Upper East Side, where all their baked goods are gluten-free. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. Research shows the number of children affected by autism spectrum disorders is growing, growing at a troubling rate. Today, a closer look at what's behind that and how families are coping. Right. When he was just a baby, Joey, now 17 years old, started having seizures. So our journey began with a seizure disorder which we came to learn many years later that um, autism and seizures are quite common. And the language that Joey seemed to be developing as a baby disappeared. He was, he was fine. Really, he had a first birthday. He was walking around, he was saying, what's that? He was counting in English and Spanish. And then it all just stopped. Joey was diagnosed with autism and it changed not only his life, but his mother's too. We would lay there and I would say to him, you know, someday, your trips aren't going to be to the hospital. You're going to go someplace where there's going to be fun stuff and there's going to be things to do and you're going to have friends and you're going to go to parties and you're going to do things like everybody else. Jackie found a mission in life she never anticipated and so SNAC came to be, the special needs activity center for kids that she founded in 2003. When she couldn't find an after school program for Joey, Jackie created her own and what started with a handful of children has grown to serve about 150 families. I just wanted to have people to have a chance to meet other people, to see their kids having fun. I can't tell you, it's, it's not right that I should have been told as many times as I have, I've never seen him laugh like that. You know, that's not right when a kid's six years old, that he's never laughed like that. That's terrible. So that's what our mission is, to give parents that hope for their kids to have friends and for people to have fun. It's incredible to see Joey... Uh, interact, even though he doesn't talk and the, the kid he may be playing with doesn't necessarily talk, but they see each other a couple times a week. They're definitely buddies. I mean, you can see that when they see each other and the way they hang out. It, it's, it's huge for us. The need for such programs seems to be growing as data shows more children than ever are being diagnosed with autism spectrum disorders. The Centers for Disease Control estimates one in 88 children has been identified with an autism spectrum disorder. That's a 78 percent increase since the first report in 2007. And the numbers show the disorders are almost five times more common among boys than girls. The rate is increasing and increasing and increasing. Susan Longton is an assistant professor in the Department of Speech, Communication, Arts and Sciences at Brooklyn College and a licensed certified speech language pathologist who's worked with children with autism for years. She explains there are likely multiple factors behind the increase in the incidence of autism. But 
it suggests that there are more kids out there, which I think there really are from my, you know, training generation way back. How, and I think it's also because we've broadened the spectrum, you know, to include, you know, milder forms of autism. As more children are diagnosed with autism, more families are affected. For example, siblings like Andrew, Joey's 13-year-old brother, who is wise beyond his teenage years. I'm the older little brother. Even though I'm not even up to his shoulders, I'm like his older brother. It makes you have to grow up faster because you have to eventually, I'm eventually going to have to take care of Joey. As worrisome as the new data is, Jackie says she also sees progress. I've seen tremendous, tremendous progress in the younger children that are coming to snack now. Mm -hmm. The intervention is swift, um, it's good, it's proven. So I see a lot more kids with language younger than, than Joe had the opportunity to just because we didn't know. So that to me is so hopeful. Despite the statistics and the obvious impact autism has on many families, Jackie and other parents point out there is help, and there is hope. I'm Carol Ann Riddell for Science and You. I'm Mike Gilliam for Science and You. Stem cell transplants, just one of the new medical breakthroughs that are coming from science that are helping people who suffer from sickle cell disease. We're going to take a look now at exactly how they work. Uh -huh. Charles and Michael Pena look like any other kids playing video games. But for them, life has not always been fun and games. Throughout childhood, both have battled sickle cell anemia and the chronic pain it causes. I always had a lot of leg, leg crisis. I couldn't walk. Um, I couldn't move my legs. Um, like I, they were like almost immobilized for the whole time being. Like That's how bad it got to the point where like they had to give me drugs that they wouldn't give a 12-year-old boy, you know. We couldn't do a lot of things, like we couldn't play sports, we couldn't um, be in temperatures that were below 86, so winters were kind of hard because you had to stay inside or wear a lot of clothes. And in the summer, if it got too hot, we could get heat strokes and come to the hospital. On hot summer days, they could only stay in the pool for 15 minutes at a time. It was always precautions and, you know, watch out, you're going to get sick and hospital is my life. Hospital is my, my second home. But they found help. Doctors Monica Batia and Nancy Green are experts in the field, working out of Columbia University Medical Center, where they're using cutting-edge medical treatments developed through years of scientific research to help kids with the disease. So what is sickle cell? Sickle cell is an inherited blood disorder. So uh, it's a lifelong disorder. People start it from when they're babies and uh, live with it through their whole lifespan. And lifespans are typically shortened to 45 or 50 years. Green says the chemistry of sickle cell, which affects about 100,000 Americans, most of whom, but not all, are of African descent, has been known for a long time. But there have been recent strides in the field yielding medications that are effective. We have a drug that we use for sickle cell increasingly commonly called hydroxyurea. And in children and in many adults with sickle cell, that has converted the disorder from a debilitating disorder to something that they live with and really have very mild symptoms most of the time with, with this one simple medication. So that's an amazing change. And then, um, and then there's transplantation. It used to be called bone marrow transplant. Now we call it hematopoietic stem cell transplant. So the science of that has really matured and now for a limited number of people who have the appropriate donors, usually siblings, um, they can be cured of sickle cell disease. So cured. that's cured, cured. So that's, that's, big, that's big science. That's very sophisticated science. And that is the medical science that Dr. Batia practices. What you're doing is giving them chemotherapy, essentially wiping out their body's ability to produce any of these abnormal red blood cells. But at the same time, you need to replace the bone marrow with healthy functioning cells. And this is done by harvesting a donor and infusing those cells into the patient. The cure rates have really increased um, up to about 90%. The treatment is relatively new, only about 550 cases worldwide, but all with that same 90% cure rate. They've done 30 of them at Columbia University. Right now, donors have to be genetic matches or siblings who are disease-free. 
The Pena Brothers cells were donated by their courageous six-year-old brother, Alex. It worked, and now the doctors say they're cured and leading normal lives. After that one year hit, that I was doing stuff that I never did. I went in the pool and I stayed in for two hours. Did not come out. I went and played in the snow with the minimal amount of clothes that I could wear, nothing happened. I played in the hot summer all day, didn't wear sunscreen, didn't do anything. I was kind of reckless and nothing happened. That's when it hit me like, wow, you know, I'm cured. And that came I through science, great. right? Yeah, science, definitely. Love science, always. Thank you very much. <laughs> I appreciate science a lot. It was actually my favorite subject at school. Over the next, say, 10, 15 years, where do you see things going? I think that um, while I think supportive therapies will improve, I think transplant can be extended to other patients and patients who don't have sibling donors. And that is my hope that we can offer transplant to people, um, even if they don't have a brother or a sister who is a match, by increasing volunteer participation in the registry. So they're all hopeful that scientists will continue to break new ground that will benefit those with sickle cell and other diseases. I'm Mike Gilliam for Science and You. I'm Donna Hanover. More than 100,000 people woke up this morning hoping this is the day they get the call. If they do, someone thought ahead or a family in the midst of grief made the decision. It's a typical day at the office for Helen Irving. Discussing clinical matters is par for the course in her line of work. As president and CEO of the New York Organ Donor Network, Helen leads her staff in a daily effort to secure life-saving human organs suitable for transplantation. The challenge is unrelenting. There are 10,000 people waiting for organs right here in New York. We have 10% of the wait list right here. Yet last week, only five families agreed to donation. Only five? You, so you would think five. from the news stories that it was a regular thing. In actuality, no, it's not. Um, you know, last year we only saw 264 families donate in the New York area. One organ donor can save up to eight lives, and yet only 18% of New Yorkers aged 18 and older have signed the state's organ donor registry. Every 13 hours, someone dies while on the waiting list for a transplant. A hard statistic not lost on Dr. Michael Goldstein, medical director of the New York Organ Donor Network. The biggest risk to patients is the time on the waiting list because at that point their own disease becomes more severe. For liver patients it's even more dramatic because again there's no backup system. So as they get sicker the operation gets dramatically more dangerous for them. Lawrence Pardis, a financial engineer in Washington DC, had his life renewed after multiple liver transplants. For him it was a smooth transition. Every for me um, was was very quick and so once I had had the, all three transplants um, getting back to my normal life um, happened very quickly and it um, for me there were very little restrictions in terms of what I can do what I can eat the offices of the organ donor network are decorated with memorial quilts paying tribute to those who at the end of their lives gave of themselves to save others I try to think of it more as you know, they gave me this gift and you know, it's sort of my job to uh, do something with that gift and to, um, you know, to, do, to live a good life, to be a good person. Modern science has advanced to a point where most transplant operations are considered a relatively low risk. There is now a very high success rate for kidney, liver, pancreas, and cornea transplants. Even heart and lung transplants are commonplace. But organ donation is a decision the entire family needs to make. It is a crucial conversation. We need to have more of them, and we need to know what our end-of-life decisions would be. And do that now, not in time of a crisis when something awful happens to a loved one. For Marie Le Personary, the decision to donate was made with compassion and love after her son was hit by a car. You endured uh, every mother's worst nightmare, yeah. which is that you got a phone call. Oh, on New Year's Eve, by the time I got to the hospital, you know, he, he was in a coma. He, um, they were doing brain surgery, and he, um, they didn't give him much hope, you know. And then eventually, um, he had a stroke, I think, the next day, and eventually, you know, he, they said that he was um, brain dead. Sean LePersonary was a decorated Iraqi war vet. He survived the battlefield only to lose his life on a dark Long Island street. He was 24 years old. But Marie saw through her grief 
and knew what she had to do. Sean was registered through the Army to be an organ donor. He would want to save lives. Sean's liver and both kidneys were donated, and the lives of three strangers were saved. Our devastation was somebody's miracle, you know what I mean? And we made it happen, and how beautiful is that? Now, you have a beautiful blanket on your lap. Yeah. What, what is the story of the blankets? Um, a friend of mine gave me the blanket, and we um, put it on Sean, and the room no longer looked sterile. And um, I snug up, snuggled up next to Sean, and I, um, you know, I said my goodbyes. In her son's memory, Marie started Sean's Gift, a program to provide blankets like these to be placed on the organ donor and to comfort the families left behind. I wake up every day, one foot in front of the other, and I know that my son lives on. I know that um, I find a great deal of comfort, you know, knowing that, you know, he, he, we saved lives. Thanks to Marie, other organ donor families have taken great comfort in a blanket that covered their loved one. And of course, they have the comfort of knowing the person they loved has given others life. I'm Donna Hanover for Science and You. I'm Magalie Laguerre Wilkinson. Everyone knows that to stay healthy, you have to eat right. But when it comes to your gut, there's much more at play than just your diet. When it comes to illness, Dr. Stephen Lamb has been a longtime proponent of moving from intervention to prevention. And the underappreciated gut is the centerpiece. How essential is the gut to overall health? Well, look, to be realistic, you know, every organ system is extremely important, and we wouldn't want to live without our kidneys or our lungs or our heart and the brain. But, you know, the gut probably has a very special place. It's more than just, quote, the stomach, which is what most people think is the gut. As he explains in his book, No Guts, No Glory, some of the most overlooked parts of the system are, in fact, the most important. The reality is the gut encompasses this beautiful, beautiful orchestration of hollow organs, your esophagus and your stomach and your intestines, with solid organs, such as your liver and pancreas. And the average person basically has never even thought of their pancreas. The pancreas releases enzymes that ultimately break down proteins and fats and crime. I mean, it's brilliant. Along with these pancreatic enzymes, our gut also gets some help from probiotic bacteria. There are 100 trillion bacteria in your colon. And they weren't just found there for no reason. The reality is that those bacteria are also in communication with your brain. And those bacteria are salvaging some of the foods that you take in, are actually breaking them down, and are producing nutrients for the colon itself. But the more junk we eat and the older we get, the enzyme system and probiotic balance break down to the detriment of our gut. The problem is that, you know, we probably have a relative enzyme deficiency as we get older for two reasons. One, the pancreas doesn't work as well as we did when you were 12, mm -hmm. and the foods are so insanely processed and we cook them to death that we, we don't have enough enzymes to break them down. And it doesn't a, recognize them. It doesn't recognize them and doesn't break them down. You add gluten and milk products and saturated fat you mix them all together, the gut can't even empty it. The stomach can't even empty the stuff into your small intestine. So you grab that donut, you grab that hot dog just to fill you up. It's more of a function, but yet we're doing a lot of harm to ourselves. In injuring the bowel, you create what we call the leaky gut state in which these pores are, you know, all of a sudden, instead of just absorbing nutrients, start to absorb toxins, and these toxins then turn into or create an inflammatory reaction in the body which causes a lot of other issues such as heart disease and arthritis and maybe even Alzheimer's. So if you add a little bit of probiotics and digestive enzymes you will feel better within 24 hours. This is not like we don't have to, this is not a leap of faith. You don't have to be on this stuff for six months to find out if you're better. And since we can control what goes into our gut, we can also control much of what goes into our overall health realize that the foods you eat have to have nutrient value. They have to be digestible. It's all connected. It's all connected. The body doesn't have any walls, okay? So, you know, I mean, pe people think of heart healthy. Well, if it's heart healthy, it's brain healthy. If it's brain healthy, it's gut healthy. So, you know, whatever you do will have a collateral benefit in a lot of different organ systems. It's a simple formula, really. The better we treat our gut, the better we'll feel. But of course, with the busy lifestyles we lead, it's kind of hard to eat well every single day. But if you just trust your gut from time to time, the better you'll feel. 
I'm Magalie Laguerre-Wilkinson for Science and You. I'm Tina Beth Pina. You've seen the headlines. Each week, new research claims one food is better for you than another. And if you're confused about sorting the scientific fact from fiction, you are not alone. So we spoke to experts who are going to clear the way and help us understand what food does more harm than good when it comes to your health. Nutrition is a difficult subject, and it's a real difficult science. And we just don't have a lot of good information out there. And when we do get good information, it kind of gets muddled. Dr. Fred Pescatore, a Manhattan-based physician who practices nutritional medicine, believes that when it comes to nutrition and our health, we've been believing too many myths. We now have science to support some things. And I think in the past, we went on true mythology. It was really just making it up. The way the whole low-fat mythology came along was, well, if you're fat and you're eating fat, it must make you fat. And that was a total myth. None of it was, ba was, was based in science, just like the whole eggs and cholesterol thing. Eggs have cholesterol, therefore eggs must cause cholesterol, so therefore you shouldn't eat it. Yet another myth. But all of those myths, as we study them, have become debunked. According to our experts, you may be surprised by some healthy reasons for eating foods you may have been told to avoid. Eggs are one of the most nutritious foods known to man. Never eat an egg white without the egg yolk. You must have the egg yolk. Egg yolks are where all the nutritional value of an egg is. It's actually nature's um, biggest source of lecithin. And lecithin actually is a cholesterol-lowering substance. What's the myth regarding red meat? The big myth is uh, that it raises your cholesterol and that it causes heart disease. You know, beef is not a problem. And again, with any food, it should be eaten in moderation. When you look at where you can get certain nutrients just from food, red meat has something called CLA, which is conjugated linoleic acid. That's the only place in the world you can get it, is in red meat. And now we take pills of CLA. What do we take pills of CLA for? To lose weight. It helps to block, block appetite. And that's, that's only found in red meat or red meat products like butter. Mm -hmm. So that's the only place you can get that on the planet other than in a pill. So there's a reason why you can eat red meat. And it's not the saturated fat. You know, there's this whole thing about saturated fat being bad for you. It's the combination of saturated fat, sugar, and simple carbohydrates, that's the problem. The body knows how to metabolize fat and what to do with it. It doesn't know what to do with sugar. It, it is one of the most deadly combinations for heart disease. Sugar is behind, I think, six of the top leading causes of death in the United States is sugar. And we consume, I believe it's 155 pounds of sugar each year per person. So that's a lot of sweetness that we're putting into our body that our pancreas isn't able to handle. Our experts also suggest cutting back on things like pasta. And another surprise, they say butter really is better. Butter is much healthier for you than margarine. Butter is actually a real food. Again, one of the few places you get medium-chain triglycerides. Medium-chain triglycerides are overall healthier for your cholesterol. They keep your cholesterol in balance. They keep the HDLs up. They keep the LDLs down. Making smarter, better informed food choices are key when it comes to your health. Instead of using the low-fat mayonnaise or the low-fat salad dressing, to use the real food. You know, because once you start dealing with chemistry, it's, it, the food's been altered and it's not a whole food. Really what it comes down to is moderation. You can have sugar, you can have simple carbohydrates, but we need to start thinking of those as special occasion items mm -hmm. and really going more towards vegetables and um, a fruit, low sugar fruit and proteins. We ate food that was not processed by man or minimally processed, that's all you need. According to the USDA, a healthier diet could save at least $71 billion per year in medical costs and lost lives due to heart disease, cancer, stroke, and diabetes. I'm Tina Beth Pina for Science and You. Hi, I'm Erna Beldamillo in front of G Free NYC, the city's first gluten free store. It seems more and more Americans are going gluten free, some for health reasons, others because they say it makes them feel better. So, what exactly is gluten? Welcome to Pip's Place, a new Upper East Side bakery where you'll find Denise Cumming whipping up delicious treats. But there is something missing in these baked goods. That ingredient is gluten. 
my passion has always been baking, and my daughter Olivia was diagnosed with celiac disease five years ago, and uh, that changed everything in my baking world, and I opened pips for her and for everyone like her who has celiac disease or a gluten intolerance. Olivia, whose nickname is Pip, was diagnosed with celiac disease five years ago. This after years of suffering from headaches, severe intestinal issues, chronic fatigue, and mood swings. There is a massive change from five years ago till now that every, everyone really can understand that there is something called gluten and gluten intolerance. There is more gluten awareness, from bakeries like Pip's Place to stores like G Free NYC. Consumers can find gluten-free products readily available these days. Gluten can be found in many food products, from breads to soy sauce. So what exactly is gluten? Gluten is a term for the storage protein of the cereal grains, wheat, rye and barley. Most of those grains consist of carbohydrate, but each of them has a certain amount of protein, and it's the protein component that's called gluten. Dr. Peter Green is head of the Celiac Disease Center at New York Presbyterian Columbia University Hospital. He has spent several decades studying celiac disease and gluten intolerance, and is the author of Celiac Disease, A Hidden Epidemic. All of us don't appear to digest gluten very well. For an estimated 3 million Americans like Olivia with celiac disease, gluten triggers an autoimmune illness that damages the lining of the digestive tract. There are also people who have gluten-related disorders, including wheat allergies and non-gluten celiac sensitivity. But what about everyone else? The gluten-free diet has become popular lately. Celebrities like Gwyneth Paltrow and Victoria Beckham have said they've sworn off wheat, claiming it makes them feel better. I took my own unscientific study on Facebook, and several of my friends say they have also given up gluten for health reasons. Two moms wrote it helps their sons with learning disabilities. Another person wrote giving up gluten has helped her husband's asthma. And while there are plenty of anecdotes from people who are convinced eliminating gluten has made them feel better, scientists have not confirmed a real correlation with the gluten-free diet and any health benefits. Many on a gluten-free diet, they say, may just be eating healthier overall. In fact, Dr. Green warns that giving up gluten may not be healthy for the general population. It's healthy for people with celiac disease, with wheat allergy, and for people who feel better. Um, but generally the diet is not all that healthy a diet because um, the non-gluten flours, such as rice flour, is not fortified with vitamins and minerals the way they fortify wheat flour. So it's been shown that people on a gluten-free diet for a particular period of time can become iron and B vitamin deficient. He suggests taking a multivitamin if you're going to give up gluten. Meanwhile, for those who do suffer from celiac disease and wheat allergies, today's gluten-free options have been life-changing. Olivia has her mom to thank. She has provided me with everything I have missed. I, I often say that there's something that is so comforting about having something that's forbidden for so long. And um, just knowing that other people, and there, there are children out there, there are families who cannot, uh, cannot enjoy something just so simple as a cookie, right? And it's just, it's amazing what she's done, and I'm just so proud of her. So if you think you have a gluten sensitivity, Dr. Green advises that you talk to your doctor. I'm Erna Beldamillo for Science and You. Well, that's our show. I'm Mike Gilliam. We'll see you next time on Science and You.